Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So in this video, I wanted to explain the difference between a $1,000 refractor and a $4,000 refractor. So refractors like this, 80 millimeter refractors, are one of the most popular ways to start out in doing astrophotography, but they also can be one of the best ways to do advanced astrophotography. So I just wanted to discuss some of the differences between a beginner 80 millimeter refractor and an advanced 80 millimeter refractor. And for purposes of this video, I'm going to be showing some placeholder images with a slightly larger uh, telescope that's comparable to this Takahashi. So this telescope right here, the beginner telescope, is an Orion ED80T-CF. It was actually my very first astrophotography telescope, and these can be had for about $1,000 new, and you will of course need a field flattener, which will be $150 thereabouts. So for about $1,100, this is a very lovely starter telescope for astrophotography. And on the high end, I have here a Takahashi FSQ85 with a Takahashi QE.73 reducer on the back end. And this can also, you know, have a one times field flattener if you're looking to image in full frame, but New, this telescope will run you about 3500 and you'll be spending 500 to 700 for either a reducer or a field flattener on the back. So what do you actually gain with four times the cost versus just the beginner telescope? I'm going to start at the butt end by the focuser. So starting out with the focuser, you may notice that mine is not the stock focuser. I have a moonlight two inch autofocuser on the back of this telescope and that is for a very good reason is because the stock focuser on this telescope is really garbage, especially if you try to put heavy cameras on it. So for starting out, if you're using just a DSLR, uh, this is actually perfectly fine to use with the stock focuser, but as soon as you try to put, you know, a filter wheel, an OAG, a deep space camera on the back, the focuser leaves a lot to be desired and that was one of the first things I changed about this telescope is I put on the moonlight and the moonlight all in total probably costs like $950 so that right there is a big expense to make this telescope actually practically usable for any kind of deep sky and here on the advanced telescope on the Takahashi it actually has a relatively beefy focuser compared to the Orion telescope now people do have a lot of complaints about Takahashi focusers, but you do get uh, a bit more weight capacity as compared to the Orion. And you also may notice that it doesn't actually have any locking screws, like a nose piece as you would on the Orion refractor. You know, you would just insert a two inch nose piece and you lock down the clamps. This one doesn't really have that option, at least how it's set up currently. You could get adapters to add a nose piece, but this is set up to just be a threaded system. And one neat feature you get on the back of this is the camera angle adjuster here. So I can unscrew this assembly. And in theory, I think it's too tight right now. I should be able to just rotate the whole assembly to adjust the camera angle, which is a nice convenience as opposed to having to unscrew a couple nose piece uh, tightening threads. Uh, it's a bit of a simpler way to change your camera angle if you really wanted to. And since this focuser can handle a little bit more weight, I've opted to put a Prima Luce Sesto Senso on it, and this should be able to handle a camera just fine. So moving further along the telescope, the next difference is the tube manufacturing or the actual material that they use. And one thing I gotta give a hand to Orion for is this telescope. It's made of carbon fiber, and it's actually very excellent under big thermal changing conditions. So if you are to wear, as the temperature changes throughout the night, your telescope will actually physically change in size, and it's gonna shift your focus point around a whole lot if you don't have a telescope that's designed to handle thermal changes. And this telescope is actually really stable, and I've put it to a lot of work in Phoenix, Arizona, which will have very, very large temperature swings out in the desert. So surprisingly, this is actually very good tube construction, very good with handling focus changes. And I'm just really satisfied with this. For the cost, it's pretty hard to beat in terms of its focus capability. 
So on the other hand, for this very expensive telescope, it's actually built with, I think, aluminum perhaps is the, the metal that's used in this, but Takahashi's are notoriously bad with holding focus under big temperature swings. So this telescope, in my opinion, actually kind of loses out to the beginner telescope in terms of being able to hold focus throughout the night. I have another Takahashi refractor that I use at an observatory and I have to refocus it every 20 minutes, especially at the beginning of the night where there's huge temperature swings. It'll just fall out of focus almost immediately. And given part of this is due to the fact that I'm running it at a very fast focal ratio, I have mine reduced to F3, whereas the starter refractor is at a slower F6. We'll talk about that later, but it makes it harder to keep focus. Uh, it's not the best a-thermal design, and you do lose imaging time just having to focus it a lot. And that's kind of a problem with at least the Takahashi telescopes, but I personally find it worth it working around since, you know, optically, you do gain a lot of advantages for having to lose out on the, the focus problem. But that's just an interesting difference is this is actually worse at handling temperature change than a much cheaper telescope is just because of the material they use for the tube. Before I head to the front lens and discuss the differences there, I want to circle back and talk about the butt end of the telescope. Instead of the focuser, I want to talk about the flatteners and the focal reducers and what kind of differences you can expect with a starter refractor like this versus the Takahashi. So this Orion refractor from the manufacturer has two options. It has a focal reducer that can handle I think four thirds sensors at the largest. And it also has this field flattener, which can support at the most an APS-C sensor. I have ran this at full frame, but as I'll talk about later, it's really not practical to use a telescope like this with a full frame lens in most cases. And I'll show you some example images about why. But there are two options as for what you can do at the back end with the starter telescope. Whereas on this more expensive telescope, there are a whole host of options of what you could put on the back and give you a lot of versatility uh, for doing astro images. So this particular telescope has a focal reducer, a full frame focal reducer on the back, which is a QE.73. But again, there are many options. I could have a field flattener. I could have a 0.6X reducer. I could have a focal extender that are just set up for more deep sky imaging quality. And the Takahashi ecosystem kind of gives you a lot of versatility as far as reducers, extenders, any kind of things you want to add to change up your system, make it faster, and just make it better for imaging. So that is one thing you gain as an advantage with a more expensive system is you have a wider range of accessories that are better for advanced imaging. All right, now onto the front end of the telescopes. These will show the biggest differences between the two systems in terms of image quality are the optics, the front lens, and in particular, uh, an issue no one really talks about a lot is the baffling on the inside of the telescope. So this refractor is 80 millimeters, F6, 480 millimeters focal length, which is a fair amount of reach. However, it is fairly slow. And the greatest thing that it suffers from uh, as compared to a different telescope is the internal reflections that you'll experience if you attempt to go any larger than an APS-C sensor. So if you're nearby any bright stars just out of the field, your images are just full of cascades of stray light and random things coming into your image field. That won't be a problem if you're using a smaller sensor, but if you want to use a better camera, a bigger sensor, it's really not feasible to do with this telescope. And that's kind of the biggest line to draw between an expensive and a cheap uh, 80 millimeter refractor is that this can't use full frame very well versus the other telescope will actually be able to support big sensors and let you get good images that aren't full of stray light that don't suffer from bad corners. Although I will say this telescope actually has pretty good corners uh, all the way out to the edges for being only a thousand dollars. So it could handle full frame in theory in some parts of the sky, but it just suffers from internal reflections so badly that it's almost impossible to image with this in any way full frame. So let's check out the Takahashi. 
So the Takahashi here, instead of having just an 80 millimeter lens, it has an 85 millimeter lens and a 450 millimeter focal length which puts it at f5.3, I believe, which gives you an advantage with exposure time, cleaner images, less time. It's like the most important thing in astrophotography. So that's one of the biggest market advantages you get with using a more expensive telescope is it's a little faster. Uh, and this telescope is actually a bit weirder since I'm using a big focal reducer. Uh, I'm actually at f3.9 with a focal length of about 390 millimeters, I believe. So I have this reduced. It's much, much faster than the 80 millimeter. I pay with a bit of focal length, but I still get the full frame imaging and way shorter exposure times, which is actually good depending on what your goal is. My goals are to do mosaics, so I like a little wider field of view and a little bit faster. The other big advantage you get with these more expensive scopes, if I can pop off, is, I don't know if you can see it, but there is much better baffling. So this telescope, unlike the 80mm Orion, is not going to suffer from the massive flares coming in from stray light in all kinds of directions because it's a bit better baffled, which is really, really, really important. And it's not something that a lot of people touch on with full frame imaging. People usually obsess over the corners and not if you're going to have a bunch of stray light coming in all over your sensor. So that I find is probably the main advantage that you don't get a bunch of stray light and you get a bunch of extra speed and you can handle the bigger sensor. So the important question for you out there, if you're looking and deciding between which kind of telescope you want to get is, is it worth it to spend all this extra money to have this kind of a telescope? And I would say that depends entirely upon what kind of camera you intend to use it with. So if you're starting out, Chances are you're not using a full frame camera, especially monochrome because it's incredibly expensive. And in which case it does not give you that much advantage to get a telescope like this over a telescope like that. It could actually be harder to use this kind of a telescope compared to the cheaper one. So if you're starting out, I would 100% suggest you go with the cheaper telescope instead because you're going to save yourself headache with adapters and dealing with weird, you know, threading and all these kinds of things having a two inch nose piece and a much more simple way to adapt your camera on is going to be much more worth it. And you are going to actually see the benefits of an expensive telescope if you're not using a big sensor. If you are using a big sensor, then you likely already know that you will need a telescope like this and not a telescope like that to do any imaging. So if you're starting out, don't spend a bunch of money on a Takahashi. You should be looking to get maybe more of a low end 80 millimeter or even a smaller telescope if you're starting out. The Radian Raptor 61, the Sharp Star 61, uh, there's some Askar telescopes that are cheap, pretty good out to even full frame sensors, but you don't need to go and spend money on a premium refractor if you're just starting out and you're not using a full frame sensor. I would suggest you go with something much cheaper instead. So. Those are all the main differences between a $4,000 refractor and a $1,000 refractor. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments and I'll see you on the next one.